So we're here to talk about uh, a piece of music written by Rachel Yee, uh, Ar Arlene and Larry Dunn, composer in residence for the 2020-21 season. Uh, and the piece that Rachel composed is called, Is This What Nature Sounds Like? And it's a piece written for asynchronous youth orchestra. In other words, it's a piece written for uh, Noyo's young musicians of which we have a little more than a hundred. Um, and they're gonna be playing together, working on this piece, but they're, they're performing asynchronously. That is to say, they're gonna be playing their parts at home and then sending in video and audio of those performances to me. And then I'll sort of composite it all up into a performance after the fact. That's an asynchronous um, orchestra format. So I wanna ask Rachel, uh, if you wouldn't mind letting us know, what is, is this what nature sounds like, which is the piece that you composed? What is that piece about? So this piece is about the interaction between humans and animals, mostly. So we enter the piece beginning with a nature scene with all these animals such as birds and crickets and a few other insects. And we just glimpse at their life and then a human comes along and sees these animals and starts calling out to them and interacting with them. And then the human goes back into it their home and figures out how to interact with these animals from the home and then we end returning back into the nature with these animals and the animals are now repeating some of the gestures and the sounds from the human that they've learned from the human because the animals learn from the human and humans learn from the animals. Excellent. Um, may I ask, uh, in what respect was the piece designed for the asynchronous orchestra format? In other words, how did you take into account the fact that unlike a regular orchestra piece, this is a piece for, you know, 100 musicians who are all scattered throughout Northeast Ohio, and they get together every Sunday to rehearse together, um, but they work, you know, quite a bit individually, and they'll be performing the piece on their own. How did you, how did you um, uh, sort of tailor the piece to accommodate that unusual situation? So I started by thinking by this, what spaces I can use because normally you wouldn't have too much control of that. You're in a concert hall. And so part of being at home in various places means that you have access to different spaces. So in addition to creating musical gestures, I suggested some spaces for the musicians to record and to recreate this outdoor feeling or this indoor feeling in terms of the musical content, I wanted it to be something that would challenge them, but also not too difficult without instruction, because there's only so much you can do online and you don't want to make it impossible. So I tried to figure out what can I do? What was I doing in band back when I was playing instruments? And how can I bring that to these musicians? and while still challenging them. And a lot of that was also challenging myself because I had never written for such a large instrumentation before. And so also was finding a balance between the instruments to create these musical sounds. You know, I had no idea that you uh, had a band background or that you were a, had a sort of large ensemble um, you know, background as a participant in music. Could you talk a little bit about that? You don't have to go into great detail if you don't want to, but what was your, what was your preparation as a large ensemble player? So I started playing flute in fifth grade and I continued playing until about my freshman year of high school in which I was presented the opportunity to play the tuba. So I took that opportunity. I played the tuba and I, played in the concert band since that was the only thing we had at my school in terms of wind opportunities. And I have not continued in college. I've uh, picked up a few other instruments while here, but I have not continued playing in a large ensemble. Um, can I ask, uh, looking now ahead to the future, what projects do you have on the horizon? Like what's, what's next for you after this piece? So, one thing I enjoyed about this process was learning about more of these instruments that I'm less familiar with. So 
going back to the previous question about my background in terms of a large ensemble. So I'm a wind player, and so I know a fair amount about that and how to approach writing for those instruments. So this gave me an opportunity to further learn how to write for string instruments, which is something I'm not very familiar with. And so I would like to continue doing more with those string instruments, learning more about their extensive techniques. And then also my class this past semester was about learning how to do live electronics and live processing. And so I will be incorporating some of those techniques with some string instruments. Great. Um, that's really, uh, it's really inspiring to hear that the um, experience of working on this piece uh, is giving you something that you can bring to bear on what sounds like it will probably end up being a quite different piece from this uh, next time around working with string players, you know, I would assume conservatory string players um, and, and live, uh, live electronics. That's really wonderful. Just the difference between a flute and a tuba is so <laughs> enormous um, that that I thought that was uh, pretty interesting that you would move from flute to tuba, and not make any stops in between. <laughs> and actually, I had a question for Rachel or maybe for all of you about the nature of the piece um, when you were talking about the uh, insect sounds and things. Uh, is there an electronic or a pre-recorded component of this piece that uh, provides real insect sounds or simulated, or are you having the the players make sounds that sound like insects? So in this piece, I'm having players recreate these in insect sounds. So I thought about the timbre. So what sound, what instruments might sound like some of these insects? Oh and then what techniques might sound similar or are very, uh, um, perhaps, I'm thinking close, but that's what similar means. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah. techniques that are very similar to what these insects sound like in real life. Right, well, we can't wait to hear all of this come to life, indeed. Um, Antoine, a, a question for you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'm really curious to know if you could describe the rehearsal process uh, for Philharmonia Orchestra, which is the ensemble that you direct with Noyo during this online season. You know, we have these Sunday afternoon Zoom rehearsals. What actually goes on in one of those Zoom rehearsals? What's it like to work on a piece like Rachel's uh, with your Philharmonia musicians? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, this, obviously this, uh, this, uh, working in Zoom is far different than anything <laughs> that I've ever done. And so, but it's it's offered us some unique opportunities to explore our music making and, um, and learning about the pieces in ways that we probably would not have done uh, in, in a traditional sense. Um, so um, obviously we, we're afforded the chance to do a lot of listening. Um, so right at the top, whenever we're taking on the new pieces that we're doing, for example, Rachel's piece, and the fact that there's no recorded version of this piece, we're able to listen to MIDI renditions of the works um, or, or live recordings, um, not live recordings, but a, or of recordings. I've taken the opportunity to allow the students to watch some streaming services like the Berlin Philharmonic for some other uh, works that we are learning. Uh, so th those opportunities have kind of open up uh, being that we're in a, more of a different technology technology based uh, learning situation. Um, so yeah, instead of the traditional uh, perform uh, experience of rehearsing together and everyone playing together, uh, we have to do different things. And one of those things has been to allow the students to volunteer um, and play excerpt excerpts from different pieces that we're working on. Um, Recently, we kind of switched gears a little bit because um, some students volunteered more than others and we wanted to make sure that we were hearing everyone and, and able to give feedback to everyone. So uh, Zoom, for example, allows us to break, uh, have breakout rooms. So we can do as many we want. I think we go up to 99, for example. And so we'll put two to three students in a room and encourage them 
to play for each other, to communicate, because one of the things that we really want to um, continue is that social aspect of the learning. And, you know, and that's kind of difficult when you're sitting in your own room behind a, you know, a screen. So we encourage the students to play for each other, but also to get to know each other in those breakout rooms. And then while they're doing that, me, myself, and other coaches and instructors are going around and getting to listen to them up to three to four minutes, uh, giving them feedback. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the way we've kind of been dealing with this new world that we're in. <laughs> well, it's, it's so, uh, as, speaking now as Noyo's ED, um, it's really wonderful to hear that uh, we're, we're, we are continuing to learn how to do this, right? There's no mm -hmm. instruction manual. Right. Uh, in, as of August 2020 for how to have an online youth large ensemble music program. Um, so we've had to, to really try to be um, flexible and adaptive and to learn as we go. Uh, and all of our conductors, including Antoine, um, have done a really, really great job at that. And it's, uh, it's very inspiring to see. Specific to is this what nature sounds like? Mm -hmm. What are the Philharmonia musicians grappling with in learning this piece that might be of use to them as they you know, go on and learn more rep in the, in the future? Well, I think I just start with the big picture that I am so proud of Noyo and especially their um, co the collaboration with Arlene and Larry. Um, you know, when I first learned about this position and I learned about what you all do, I was so excited because um, the fact that you're giving the chance to those voices who don't often get a lot of light um, shine on them in our field. So I think it's really important that the students see that this organization is about promoting women and people of color, especially in composition, um, that there's voices out there to be heard. So, um, you know, again, bringing, this is the second work that I um, have the fortune of, of doing through this program. So it's, it's, the students see this as something normal, you know, that, wow, yeah, we have a female composer. We have a person of whatever descent this is. So I think, you know, this piece adds to, to that mission and I think it's very important. And the other thing is uh, Rachel's piece is programmatic in nature. It has extra musical meaning. And it was so nice to hear you talk about, you know, that what are the, the animals and the humans learning from each other? So I think there's a larger message for our students in this work. One, um, how can I make my instrument sound like a cicada or a bird or a flute? But what can I take away about humanity and our place in the world? So I, I think those two things just really stand out. Um, and I'm so happy that we get to do this. Man, that's a great answer. <laughs> and then finally, uh, you know, we, I think Arlene's question uh, spoke <clears throat> a little bit, but you know, in your craft as a conductor, and you you work for um, a number of arts organizations beyond Noyo, you have a, a really thriving career uh, in a whole bunch of places. Um, you know, what what have you learned just as a as a as a musician, as a conductor, as a sort of craftsperson uh, working online this year? I I think it's been the resilience of students and my colleagues that um, despite. Um, what we're going through, there are a good number of them. And you can attest to this, Colin, the numbers for Phil are very strong for the fact that we're online. So the fact that they love this experience, this organization so much that they are willing to go in a different direction, I think speaks um, volumes. And I think for me, it's just realizing, hey, you have to work outside of the box. Um, you know, obviously in my training, I you know, dealt with technology or, I, you know, learn finale, I can write a piece, but having to kind of educate in this way was something I was not at all prepared for. So it basically taught me that I'm resilient, that uh, there's ways that we can make these things work. And uh, yeah, so those are things I kind of take away from this season, this pandemic. It's been a, uh, it's been a challenging time, but, you know, sometimes uh, in, and probably in any field, but it's it's possible if you reach a certain level of professional accomplishment, and and you know you you may have been at that point. You know we all know, uh, just talking about musicians, musicians who are they're very competent, 
And they basically can get to the point where they don't need to learn anything new to keep doing their jobs at the same baseline level of success. Right. Um, and they basically, you know, you can call it going through the motions or, or whatever, but like they might be c- perfectly capable musicians, but they're, no one is making them uh, at grow, right? No one is really challenging them. Well, this year challenged everybody. Right. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> we, we've all had to learn a bunch of new tricks. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that there is, uh, you know, obviously this is not the way we all wanted it to go down, but uh, there is something healthy about being thrown the occasional curveball um, mm-hmm. in, in the way that you work. And I, I think that, uh, I hope anyway, that the students have benefited from that too. Um, where, when, you know, if nothing else, when they return to the rehearsal room, they'll have a newfound appreciation for, um, you know, b- being able to, to do this thing that maybe we kind of took for granted a little bit in the past. Yeah. Yeah. A couple okay. of questions for Larry and Arlene, if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, as the, um, the benefactors of the Arlene and Larry Dunn Composer in Residence program, which is one of Noyo's, you know, one of the, the, the brightest and most um, um, important feathers in Noyo's cap, I think we, we can safely say. Um, why was this uh, Composer in Residence program configured the way that it is uh, something that you really wanted to make happen? Well, you know, I think that this, this discussion today is already getting to the to the heart of what we were hoping for. And, and, <clears throat> and it's so gratifying to see it all happening. Um, you know, part of it was certainly from, it related to what Antoine was saying, was um, finding a way to make sure that we're shining a light on people that uh, are often left behind and left out um, in the way our not only our arts institutions and orchestra, orchestras and such, but our whole society has operated. Um, and it takes definitive action to do something about that. And that's something that we wanted to do. Um, but it's also a matter of, there's a two way thing here of putting, like putting the resources of an orchestra um, <clears throat> in, in the hands of a young composer like Rachel um, I think is, is for many of these composers that we will have will be a new challenge, as Rachel said. She hasn't had to try to have these many forces do something before. Um, and it, uh, it just opens up new ways of thinking for the composer, probably earlier in their composition career than might otherwise happen. And that, I think, is um, you know, a way that we can provide an opportunity for a composer each year to have this incredible growth uh, opportunity to tackle something like this. And then for the players, it's it's unusual for young players to be grappling with a piece that's in the making during their season and to really interact with the composer and, and start to understand how composers make these decisions about what they're trying to do, um, you know, whether it's um, with a traditional gestures on the instrument or unusual things because you want it to sound like a cicada or a frog or whatever. Um, And I think it gives the students a whole new uh, uh, insight into where music comes from as a composer both thinks about these things and then interacts with the group of people that are going to play it. uh, And it sort of rises organically from, from this interaction. And I think, you know, giving that experience to these young musicians um, was another real driving force for us. Yeah. Um, and just, it, well, um, just the the whole notion that um, that youth orchestras should be performing works that are being written today. Uh, this is, uh, um, you know, for the longest time, youth orchestras simply were performing the old traditional uh, music. And, uh, and so we were really anxious that, that youth orchestras, that we shouldn't deny youth orchestras the opportunity to be playing uh, brand new pieces. Um, and um, I'm really glad to uh, hear Rachel talk about using electronics and, and um, extended techniques and these sorts of things, because oftentimes young people are not exposed to those um, innovations. Um, and, and even 
the pieces that might be written today might not be using electronics or even extended techniques for that matter. Um, so, so I'm happy um, that Rachel uh, is incorporating that into, into this piece. And, um, and that in general, I think that's a good thing for, for young people to get that kind of exposure and experience. It, it should be said, um, you know, that Arlene and Larry are, uh, in addition to their, um, the role that they have, you know, with Noyo, they're also boosters of contemporary music, really all, all over the, you know, all over the country, I think it's fair to say. Um, and not, not every youth orchestra has, you know, supporters like Arlene and Larry in their orbit, who are, you know, really enthusiastic about the mission of the orchestra, but are also aware of um, currents and developments happening in the field of music and and in particular I think in the field of um, you know new music for for young uh, performers um, so it's we're, we're, we're doubly lucky to have them with us because uh, it's not just that they um, you know they they want noyo to, to be successful it's also that they are their um, their ear is to the ground mm. over a, a great deal of musical activity all over the place um, and they're able to uh, have very um, uh, sort of thoughtful contributions um, to to what Noyo does, and I just I can't uh, thank them enough. Um, thank you. So uh, one last question for the Duns, uh, and then I'll I'll open it up if anyone else wants to discuss anything further. We certainly can. Um, what positive change uh, do you hope might come out of this this very difficult time? For the performing arts, and that's a question not just about you know youth orchestras or about Noyo, but about the the, the field of, of music, which may look very different you know next year than it, it has in in recent memory. Yeah, I think there were. Um, I think we learned two things um, um, specifically uh, during this unusual period. One is that um, ensembles have um, uh, learned um, new ways of bringing music um, to their patrons, uh, other than just in the concert hall, whether that be a small or a large one, or even in people's living, living rooms, um, that they've learned how to make videos and post videos and use even live streaming. And I think uh, that, that um, they're gonna continue using those methods. I, I would hope that they do because it broadens their audience um, and gives them an opportunity to communicate to more people and expose their music to more people uh, by using this, um, this online um, sharing, sharing technique. And the second um, comes out of the, uh, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations that happened um, uniquely, I think, um, because of the pandemic, pandemic in some ways that um, it's hard to parse out just why this got so much attention, particularly by um, the white larger community, uh, that there was so much more support from there than in um, in the past, you know, millennia really supporting. Um, uh, the closet causes of, of African Americans here in this country, um, and as a result of that, many uh, musical organizations, ensembles, and performers, and what have you, they um, are now committing themselves to being um, uh, more um, uh, proactive in terms of being inclusive. A lot of these. Uh, organizations may have had this in their clauses that they're of course um, non-discriminating and the, but now they're they're actively trying to create uh, routes to to do this. Now time will tell if that will um, actually uh, work in the long run. Um, I certainly hope so and that it will be successful and that we'll see more and more, uh, people of color and Af African Americans and and um, uh, gender binary, non-binary genders, and all kinds of um, uh, opportunities in the future um, to happen. We're we're encouraged, um, although all 
always with caution. <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of need to be holding uh, people's feet to the fire. <clears throat> yeah. And I will say, um, uh, this is the fourth um, composer in residence that we, so, yeah. we've been doing. <clears throat> um, and, and still, we have yet to have um, an African American. We've had people of color, we've had women, we've had uh, non-binary, um, but um, so we're we're anxious that to have um, an African American composer coming up soon, and we need to figure out ways to get people to apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But and the, and the the um, worth noting, I think that the 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 problem of the holding feet to the fire uh, challenge um, is something that has to be that has to be undertaken at every sort of tier of, yes. of making. I mean, it, it's, we're a youth orchestra, but this, this problem is endemic uh, to at least the same extent in, you know, professional orchestras and, and, you know, community orchestras and sort of all through the ladder of, of music making. Right. Um, Including the, you know, the colleges, conservatory. Oh, and conservatory and all the, and many conservatories. Yeah. Um, so it's so work to be done. Yeah. Heavy lifting perhaps. Because I think the, the changes that we've seen in this period um, from ensembles and presenters and things uh, is not only about uh, these changes in presenting music performance, but um, we've been involved in many interesting uh, interchanges, symposiums and other things um, that are, I think many ensembles have taken new steps to try and really engage with their public in a way that isn't just, we perform, you listen, um, but it's a, more of an interaction. And I think many of them are learning uh, things from that experience that um, they had, in a sense, been um, depriving themselves of, that I think is going to really um, change the way uh, they make music, present music, and interact with their with their um, interest group, if you will. Um, and I think some of that intersects with the uh, challenges they're giving themselves to be more inclusive and open um, because some of what they're hearing in these discussions is the ways in which they're throwing up roadblocks, which they may not even realize, um, but they haven't engaged in a way that helps them see it. Uh, and I think even if like um, streamed concerts and things probably not going to continue at this um, extent, although there may be cases where to draw in a larger audience is still a great idea. But I think we'll continue to see this um, kind of open forum thing and, and online experiences to engage with the artists with their people, um, because I think it's really extremely valuable to both sides of that equation. And may I say, dare say that um, the, uh, the the quality of the music that we're going to hear is is um, is is going to be so broadened um, by the input of people that we haven't um, really welcomed um, into the concert hall. So we're going to be. It should be exciting. I mean, it's not. It's not just for the purpose of diversity, it is also for the purpose of our enjoyment and how much um, more we are gonna get by, uh, by broadening the, who is, who is putting the input, who is doing the input. Like where the music is coming. Yeah. Right. 